the ninth speaker in the uh, in, uh, Energy and Fuels Division's monthly invited talk series. And we have a very famous speaker today. Um, it turns out that, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, turns out that Chu Sung Song, who's gonna be giving the talk today, and he and I have known each other for five decades. I did the math. Now, it turns I'll... out we met when he was a graduate student. That, okay? So a, a while ago. Um, but um, yes, yes. I think most of the people on this on this uh, know him. But I'm going to actually go through uh, some of the important stuff. And I'll put my glasses on because it's late in the day. Um, so uh, Tuzan got his, his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Dalian University of Technology in 82. And then he spent some time um, learning Japanese because in uh, 1983, he joined the, uh, uh, the group of Professor Nomura in the Department of Applied Chemistry at Osaka University. And it was while he was a graduate student that he and I met at either probably at both the Maastricht uh, International Conference on Coal or the, um, the one in Tokyo. We, I know for sure we met in the one in Tokyo. Was, and he was at both of them and I was at both of them. So that's, that's, that's when we met. And then after he got his PhD in Osaka in 89, where he worked on catalytic coal liquefaction. He spent a short time at Osaka Gas Company doing the same kind of thing. And then Harold Schobert discovered him, or actually, I think he knew him before that, and invited him to come to Penn State as, as a research associate. And, and in, in short time, he became an assistant professor, then an associate professor, then a professor of fuel science at Penn State, and then a distinguished professor of fuel science at Penn State. So he's had a long, illustrious clear, uh, career at Penn State. And, and he also, while he was there, he was the dir director of the Energy Institute from 2007 to 2020, and the founding director of a DOE University Coalition uh, for Fossil Energy Research, uh, which was funded out of the uh, National Energy Technologies Laboratory from 2015 to 2020. Last year, he retired. From Penn State and and joined um, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where he's a dean of faculty of science and the Wenlun professor of chemistry. And so he still has his illustrious career is moving on. His research interests are in 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 initially was in one of the toughest catalytic problems there is, and that's coal liquefaction. But he's worked in a lot of different catalytic areas related to energy and fuels. Um, and he's looked at CO2 separation, he's looked at separation techniques, absorption, oxidation, catalytic processing of fuels, uh, shape selective uh, catalysis, uh, synthesis, and the application of men, of course, materials, who he and I have worked on together. And so this is, the, he has a broad area of interest in the catalysis. And because of that, and because of the things he, and he also uh, was very active both in the division of fuel chemistry and division of petroleum chemistry, and then the now, and he's still very active in the division of energy and fuels, which the two, two divisions merged into. He is a fellow of the American Chemical Society. He received the, uh, and the other slide uh, shows a picture. The, the other slide, yeah, shows a picture of him re receiving the George Ola Award in 2019. And there's a really good article that just came out um, this month in Catalyst Today, discuss it to that award. So I think that's really nice. But he also got earlier, he received the ACES Storage Award, uh, the Energy and Fuels Distinguished Researcher Award, uh, the Herman Pines uh, Catalysis Award from the, the Chicago uh, Catalysis Club. Uh, and he is um, a Fulbright Distinguished Scholar in 2009 and went to the went to England. Uh, so he has a lot of other awards, but those are the, the big ones, especially the ones in, in, in energy. Um, he um, also, his research interests, I, I mentioned that are, are quite broad, but he is, the one thing about Chusong is he's always, always a very positive, energetic guy. And every time I've met him, it's just, you know, it's just been always a, a pleasure. 
And so I am looking forward to hearing his talk now. Uh, now that he's a dean, and we'll see uh, how his research is going. I imagine dean being a dean, you know, occupies some of your time, I would think. Uh, for later. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to hearing you talk to you song and more is yours. Actually, the airwaves are yours, the electrons. <laughs> you can share. Okay. Oh, and while he's getting set up here, um, at the end, uh, you can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand there, in the reactions button. There's that raise your hand thing. And you can do that and, and we'll do a, a, you know, questions after the, at the end of his talk. So thanks. And keep yourself muted, please, including me. Uh, I'm sharing the slide. Uh, are you able to see the slide? Huh? We can see them, but they're they're not in presentation mode. Put them, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Randy. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction. It, um, Randy, you know, you, you your remarks and uh, recollection of bring out a lot of great memory that I had since our first meeting in Mars Tolihit, when I was uh, deeply involved in the, in the coal research uh, and trying to liquefy coal. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, almost is a official beginning of my uh, work in the area of carbon-based chemistry. Um, and I also want to thank you, Louise. Uh, she has been working hard to organize a uh, monthly invited talk for the energy and the fuel division and also uh, I want to thank the ACS Energy and the Field Division, and that has been my professional home for over 30 years. Um, so I'm very, very grateful. <clears throat> um, today, I'm very happy to share with you uh, about some of the research we're doing. Uh, also, um, it's uh, a great time to see many friends, um, although some of you are in the uh, uh, no-show mode in the video, but just uh, seeing your name, make me feel happier since I left the Penn State and came to Hong Kong. I haven't been traveled anywhere. Um, that's for almost a year. In the past, I would have made a three to five international trips in addition to the domestic traveling this much a long time. Um, <clears throat> and so this is a really a precious moment for us to be together virtually and, and talk about the science. Um, so today I will be talking about the CO2 separation and CO2 conversion to carbon neutral fuels and chemicals. Um, Dr. Randy Weinheis brought up my background and how we got to know each other, and which also is actually a different sense of a nice introduction to this research, because my motivation to start CO2 research really started from my early days, long before the climate change or greenhouse gas effect have become popular. Um, I was working on how to use coal to make a synthetic fuels in the Osaka University with Professor Nomura. And shortly during my uh, uh, postdoc research in Osaka Gas Company, I was doing the research on catalytic coal gasification to make a thin gas and liquefied uh, natural gas in Japan because there's no energy. So <clears throat> toward the later part of my PhD research, I actually read about uh, Professor George Orlar's article who actually indicated that we should worry about more limited uh, supply of fossil fuels. Um, and then I wrote um, a couple of uh, review articles on how to develop specialty chemicals and value added materials after writing that review, which was published in Fuel Processing Technology, my thought went further, saying that even though we make use for coal, coal itself is not sustainable. Um, and so how could we actually create a really sustainable fuels and chemicals? And that's the thought where uh, when my uh, advisor, Professor Nomura, uh, asked me to write an article for the journal called the Energy and Resources in Japanese Society Journal. Uh, when I was working at the Penn State for five years after my PhD. And so 
I agreed to write something uh, for my writer in, in the journal that uh, he was serving on. And so what I wrote is that I want to see um, the possibility to use CO2 from air and hydrogen from seawater to make liquid fuels and think the stuff for chemical industry. Um, initially, I think in the editorial process, they felt that this is a too um, unrealistic. And so we, do you really want to put this in? So as a suggestion to the editor, I need to put the word of dreaming so that I'm not talking about the reality. So with that agreement, I was able to put in that all such dreams of the possibility. And so this was officially published in 1995. That was the first public disclosure of my so-called dream uh, in the area for CO2 capture and utilization. So that started my long journey uh, technically from that time, although I didn't have any experimental research or conditions until 1997 or two years later from this article. Uh, but uh, my thought has started actually working on how we actually manage the CO2, how we can make use of CO2 effectively. And so I put together a chart to look at the CO2, which really is an energy problem because the global climate energy is 85% based on carbon energy. The US energy is 86% based primarily on carbon-based energy. And that including actually 81% on fossil energy, 5% on so-called biomass energy, which is also carbon-based. And the world is 1% less in terms of carbon-based energy, 84%. So globally in the US and in many countries wide, over 80% of our primary energy is carbon-based. So therefore, you will naturally produce a CO2 when you make use of those carbon-based energy. And so the greenhouse gas control is really the CO2 control um, in that sense. You have energy choice, so you have energy economic regulation. Also in the last 10 years, although the US energy uh, portfolio shifted in the sense that a lot of the uh, power plant replace coal with natural gas. But overall, within the three fossil fuel domain, we're still 80% fossil fuel. Globally, worldwide, it's 80% fossil fuel, but there's more coal, less natural gas on the global trend. So with that carbon-based energy at the global primary energy supply, we naturally, we cannot avoid the CO2 issue. So CO2 energy choice, energy efficiency, then CO2 capture and the conversion. This become naturally important issue for us to deal with. Um, so I'll be talking about the CO2 capture. And in the area for capture, uh, there are different technologies of absorption, adsorption, membrane, ionic liquid, and cryogenic. So I will be talking more on adsorption, but using a normal approach. In the conversion utilization area, there are several catalytic process and plasma catalytic process, electrochemical, photochemical, solar thermal, and biochemical process. And I will be talking about the thermal chemical and plasma chemical process. So to pictorially show what I was really dreaming for, and this uh, uh, picture shows that uh, by using um, the CO2 as a feed stock, if we could capture CO2 from the industrial sources or even from the air, and if we make the water, um, the seawater uh, conversion to hydrogen using renewable energy, and then the water will circle, basically recycle inside natural water, and um, CO2 becomes recycled as a carbon carrier. So in there, we produce carbon based chemicals, liquid hydrocarbons. And so you can call them chemicals and polymers and fuels and including gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel loop. So if we achieve for doing this, then we can call this as a sustainable fuels and chemicals or today toward the carbon neutral fuels and chemicals. And of course, the first step is how can we lower the cost of CO2 capture? Because at the, according to DOE and many industrial report that current process of CO2 capture is very energy intensive. To capture one ton of CO2, it consumes four gigajoules of 
uh, energy. And recently improved um, energy consumption cut the fall down to something like 3.7 or 3.6, and but still a huge amount of energy for CO2 capture. So um, the reason for the CO2 capture to be so energy intensive has been studied by industry. Uh, in one of the workshops that I was invited in Germany, our friend from uh, BASF shared the industrial evaluation to show that actually 15% of the heat is wasted by heating up the solvent. 35% of energy, the four gigajoule of energy, is wasted simply because water evaporates and that contributes to nothing useful. And then the other 50% is to break up the bond between CO2 and the monoacetyl amine or the other amines. And so you waste the 50% because that's the industrial process that use water tower, one absorption tower, and one stripper tower. And so our idea then is, can we remove the 15% and cut the 34% and then reduce the 40, 50% to 40 some percent? And so if we achieve that, then we would have improved efficiency by more than double the energy efficiency or over 100% improvement. So that's the basic idea, although when we start with this, there is some noise, is that coming from me or something? Okay. Uh, and so the idea to completely change the way of uh, doing the CO2 capture was instead of using a solution, we will use a polymer. The polymer has a functional group and that can capture CO2 in high density. But however, in reality, polymer itself doesn't do anything because there's no interfacial surface and the molecular functional group are not exposed at all. So in order to expose it, we created a nano cage and then trying to embed this uh, three-dimensional polymer into a nano cage and such that the polymer becomes stretched and with their end connected to the fun functional group on the surface. And if we do so, then just like you pack an apple or orange into a basket, now we can pack CO2 in high density into this nano cage. So we call this a molecular basket organ. And this is actually what you're looking at is a proposal figure that I submitted to DOE program in 1999. And so I proposed this molecular basket orbit. And this is a, a, the photo from that picture, uh, from that proposal. And when you fill the polymer, uh, which is a liquid polymer, into this uh, solid cage, up to 50%, you look at the under electron micrograph, which is a, a photo showing in the lower right, you'll see a free flowing solid. And they are actually almost like white powder free flowing. So this is what carry a significant amount of polymer functional group in the nano cage of the uh, uh, metal porous materials. And so using this, we began to be able to achieve very high capacity for CO2 capture and also very high selectivity to the CO2. Uh, with CO2 to nitrogen, with the ratio for at least like over 100 and which is much, much higher than any of the state art solid absorbent at the time, such as the zeolite uh, uh, carbon, alumina, silica, or all the commercial absorbent. And in early days, when I talked about, and then Dr. Izumi from uh, Mitsubishi Chemical in Japan said that this is amazing, and this is a better, a better than anything that the commercially they're trying to develop. And so that gives us a lot of confidence. So the first paper was published on energy in the field in 2002. Uh, we kept quietly working on for the first two years and didn't publish anything. And the, one of the important feature of the molecular bath absorber is that it actually um, captured more CO2 at the temperature elevated a little bit. And this is an interesting feature. It's almost counter counterintuitive with the thermal dynamics because uh, in the so thermal process is the passage decrease with the increase in temperature. But here we see the opposite. When you act, this is actually kinetic control in reality. Um, and then beyond a certain temperature, when you further increase temperature, capacity begin to decrease with the increase in temperature. And this is a normal. This is called a thermodynamic control. 
we actually did a collaborative study at the Oxford International Lab. Uh, it's a very short. show. Um, and there we use a, do the in situ IR um, to capture the CO2 under the IR instrument and then capture the uh, spectroscopic changes, which shows that uh, that's increasing temperature. Uh, along with the increasing uh, CO2 dropping capacity, we see the uh, significant increase in the vibration in 2935 and 2840, which is showing the uh, and symmetrical vibration of CH2, which uh, indicating that we are creating a more stretched, vibrationally excited molecule inside the cage, which is uh, the picture that we have is described below, that three-dimensional stretch the molecular basket, and that's for um, you can track a lot more CO2. Um, when you actually try to develop the isotherm, we found that in general, at the operating temperature, longer mirror isotherm fades the most better. At a lower temperature, also at a lower capacity, the uh, non-psychometric friend rich isotherm also seems to generate a reasonably good fit. But overall, longer mirror isotherm is the best fit. Um, the heat of adsorption is in a chemical adsorption range, 74 kilojoules per mole, roughly. Let me put all of this different adsorption that we developed and what has been reported in literature by numerous groups worldwide and also the commercial operation, all of the results in one chart in this exact paper in 2009. And we begin to realize that um, this molecular back adsorption, the performance is a far succeed uh, um, much uh, higher range than any of the commercial adsorbent at the, all the pressure range or the partial pressure range, and also two to three times better than what has been reported in literature, uh, all the different type of adsorbent at the, at the year of uh, 2009. So that gives us a great confidence and also give um, the uh, DOE a lot of interest in further supporting our research uh, to, to develop higher plant skill. Um, Chris Jones at the Georgia Tech had to put together a nice summary for the, all the different uh, CO2 adsorption uh, materials into one single chart. So putting our material into the chart that Chris Jones put together, molecular bath adsorbent is in the range of a low temperature CO2 capture with a much higher capacity. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, Emmanuel Giannis at Cornell University, together with Anita Park at Columbia and Chris Jones at Georgia Tech, um, they also used uh, the encouraging result of polymer polyethylamine uh, and FCMCM41 or a similar metal pore structure, but they create a, a hollow capsule um, by locating, uh, aiming into the hollow capsule. They were able to also produce the CO2 solid carbon a significantly high capacity. So that was also encouraging. And in the meantime, we developed a very different three-dimensional nanostructures um, in our group. And as you can see from this chart, the nanostructure and the three-dimensional passage of the pearl channel, they all impact the CO2 dropping capacity under the same amount of the polymer loading. So the uh, structure of the metal pearls material does matter. And in the early days, uh, based on our result in, in different parts material, DOE was uh, strongly encouraged by our result. And so we received a $3.7 million grant and to collaborate with our industrial partner to build a pilot plant to demonstrate. We first did a pilot plant test at the Penn State the demonstration boiler on coal and natural gas. And then this is second and larger scale demonstration pilot plant. So that successfully demonstrated the CO2 molecular basket. We continued our development, and that showed that uh, we can develop a broader spectrum of CO2 adsorption that can capture CO2 at a lower temperature, such as 70 degrees C or 80 degrees C, or even 140 degrees C, depending on the polymer structure, or depending on the way that arrange the functional group. Um, the um, adiosiris group in Canada, they also have um, uh, done some very interesting work on the CO2 capture using porous materials. Involves a very interesting funding is that the Thyroid group synthesized the different porous materials with a different pore lens. Um, the three different SEM photo shows the three different metal porous silica, but with a different pore lens. 
the top one shows a very long power line. The middle one shows a cylindrical a type of a poros, a, a morphology. And then the last on the, on the left is showing a disc-like porous material, which has much shorter diffusion paths. And so the diffusion paths or the long path at the pore length, the smallest one 0.2 micrometer, the largest one is 25 micrometer. The one in the middle is a cylindrical structure is 1.5 micrometer. Uh, Thayer's result showed that the longer the power length, the longer the diffusion time is. And they, therefore the, the rate, the kinetic rate is uh, slower. And that is showing the important aspect of our, our power structure. And so we have uh, synthesized some new novel structure that is a inverse cone shaped structure. Um, I think uh, somehow my top part of slide a little cut down, but I hope you can see that from your side that um, this pearl structure is a three dimensional and invert cone shape. In other words, if you put a typical surface pores is a straight, it may be three dimensional, one dimensional, but it's typical that are straight pearl or slit pearl. And here we try to create a invert conic structure and using the modified sober synthesis. So if you look at uh, the SEM photograph on the uh, left, lower left, the top one showing that it's almost like a chair like a structure. And, and then when you look at under TEM, the bottom corresponding figure, you can see that there's an opening gap on the top. The solid center is more um, dense and which is represents on the top. And we have a cone structure for the pearl. And then the right on the top right, showing the conventional metal pearls material, for example, SB15 which will have a thin and long pore channel. It's a seven nanometer in the pore diameter. So when you compare this two, uh, of course, we have a number of paper published rather than going into detail, just to simply say that this uh, inverted conic structure, when we load the polymer on the dif different structure, these two structures, this um, conic structure gave a 59% higher absorption rate and 156% higher CO2 desorption rate. So this actually gives you a much higher absorption kinetics. And, and we have done the Tyler plant test. So we know that faster rate of absorption, faster rate of desorption allow us to achieve a much, much higher um, Tyler plant operation in the future because for a 500 megawatt power plant, every day will produce over 10,000 tons of CO2. So that's tre tremendous amount. We need to make a super fast kinetic to make the commercial operation much, much faster. Um, also, there's a question. Most people in this audience know that we, in a pilot plant, we produce not only carbon dioxide, but also sulfur dioxide. And so the, there's a suggestion that you use a commercial technology, the fluid gas desulfurization, and then using molecular basket. The, our idea is that it's a too energy intensive. We can develop a novel technology that can replace it. So we develop a molecular battery to absorbent that select to capture sulfur dioxide or select to capture nitrogen dioxide, but does not touch anything on CO2. So we succeed in doing this called the sulfur and nitrogen molecular basket by using different polymer, polyethylene um, glycol type of structure that does not interact with CO2, but only interact with sulfur dioxide. So this is a continually regenerable as well. So um, <clears throat> now I've, um, I uh, talked about the CO2 capture. Now uh, let's uh, switch gear to CO2 conversion utilization. Well, of course, many of us who worked on coal research know the global cycle and the, and the uh, origin of coal and carrogens. And to put my thought back together on CO2, it's actually very natural for us to think we have to use the CO2 rather than using biomass or coal in the long run for the sustainable cycle. The reason is that biomass, coal, all come from this artificial photosynthesis, starting from this and you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, and then, of course, the fossil fuel, um, most of the organics, they decay back into CO2 and water when they expose the atmosphere. Only under special regions, when there's a delta, 
the organic mass get buried underwater and then followed by sedimentation, they form a keratin, eventually to fossil feed. This is a detour. And then they make use of fossil feed, we bring them back to the carbon cycle. Now, of course, we can use the biomass and we just uh, make use of CO2, but it relies on the Mother Earth for several years, three to five years for the so-called energy plant, or for a woody plant, take uh, 10 years or more to grow the piece of wood. And so we can make a chemicals and fuels, but the consumption speed will be much higher than biomass-based fuels. So because of that, it's natural for me to think that by using CO2 in the water, producing chemicals and fuels, this will be able to create a sustainable cycle. But of course, the premise is that there has to be renewable energy. Only the renewable energy based uh, hydrogen, uh, hydroxylated CO2 can make a chemical and fuel that can be carbon neutral and sustainable. Thermodynamically, in the early days, there's a lot of questions. Thermodynamically, CO2 is stable, but not stable enough to the point that there's no reaction. In fact, we make a commercial product that has much lower energy than CO2, but because there's a price tag, we don't feel that uh, energy consumption. In fact, we can make a chemical reaction happen and feasible and selective toward well, what we want to make. One condition is CO2 in the water needs to be considered as our phase stuff, because ultimately, as I show in the thermodynamics, for example, 12 CO2 combined together with the 13 water we can produce a dodecan molecule and that releases 18.5 more of oxygen. This is a modern reaction. We can consider that as a jet fuel synthesis or aviation jet fuel synthesis. So that can, is a typical molecular component of a jet fuel that typically is a C2 to C8 to C16. And diesel fuel is a C10 to C22. Uh, Hexadecan would be representative. So um, to make each more of the dodecan, we need to um, add a 673.8 kilojoule per mole of CO2, where we have a 12 mole of CO2 as a reactant. This minimum amount of energy that we need to add for this reaction. So if we want to convert one ton of CO2, we need 15.3 gigajoule ton of CO2. If we want to make a one ton of the liquid fuel, jet fuel, we will need to convert a 3.1 ton of uh, CO2 and that will con consume 47.5 gigajoule ton of CO2, uh, the uh, dodecan. So that gives you the order of magnitude of energy in some dynamic. Remember I said that to capture each ton of CO2, we consume four gigajoule of uh, CO2, uh, four gigajoule of energy. Chemical conversion roughly takes a four to six times higher amount of energy for the chemical reaction to happen. Um, indeed, uh, there are some commercial practice now. The Sunfire company in Germany has built a commercial plant that electrolyze water to make a hydrogen using renewable energy and then hydrogen CO2 first reduce CO2 to the CO. That's a second reaction. And in the third reaction, CO reacts with hydrogen in the so-called commercial fissure crop synthesis. So uh, the first plan by uh, Sunfire in 2020 in Norway, uh, plan to produce 8,000 tons of blue crude using CO2. So this is a renewable uh, synthetic diesel fuel uh, or, or jet fuel and the light the liquid transportation fuel. Um, and renewable energy is now on the quick right. As you can see that globally, the new capacity electric power plant is now dominantly renewable energy based. So in 2020, over 90% of new power plant addition is renewable energy based. Last year, it was 73% renewable energy based. So increasingly more and more renewable energy is used in the, in the power plant. So we will have more renewable energy. Along the line of using fissure crop to synthesis to convert CO2, there's also no account to strong California at Berkeley proposed a core shell structure where they can use a core to convert the CO2 and the hydrogen into CO. And then in the shell, it's a different type of catalyst structure and that converts the CO in fissure chapter mode to methane and C2 and the higher. And this was a core shell structure. Uh, however, we actually took a different approach philosophically. 
and we try to develop a new and more efficient catalytic process that does not require multiple stages that can convert CO2 directly to chemical fuels in one single stage. And second, our thinking philosophy was to try to design new catalytic surface that a selector target CO2 and which does not require CO as an intermediate for CO2 conversion. So we initially tried the hollow nanostructures. Uh, on the example in this, we tried the hollow nanostructure and we could turn the hollow nanostructure to produce more higher CO2 conversion and more C5 and C2 and the 5. But overall, the conversion level uh, is a satisfactory, but the product distribution, there's still too much CO and too much methane. So we tried uh, uh, to further tailor the capsid structure uh, so that we can gear up the C2 and the higher or higher hydrocarbon synthesis to much higher selectivity. And so we then turn to the biometallic capsids. We create a number of uh, biometallic capsid formulation. In the, this particular chart, you'll see that when we combine about 17% of cobalt with iron, we create a catalyst with a strong synergy to create C2 and higher hydrocarbon. Below that or above that atomic ratio, then the catalyst behaves just like a cobalt or below that behaves like iron. Only if it's a very special molecular formulation, we begin to be able to create a strong synergy to create the higher hydrocarbons. And similarly, on, to tailor the surface, we found we can produce a paraffin or we can produce an olefin if we want. Here for the same iron cobalt or biometallic, we can tailor the surface to chemistry to make the paraffin production. For example, if you look at the top chart on left, and look at the C3, this is just a propane or paraffin. But by doping the surface with some potassium species, you begin to see that we can split the C3 peak to produce a propylene and propane. When we further tailor the surface chemistry, look at down the third chart on the lower left, you can see that on the C3 peak, this is now predominantly propylene. And then compared to the top one, the same metal catalyst, but the different surface chemistry due to potassium doping. One is dominantly propane, another is dominantly propylene. So we can actually tailor the surface structure to make essentially over 70% of the uh, lower paraffin as olefin, or for example, C2C4 olefins. We can make the whole product five percent uh, olefin to paraffin ratio about uh, five to six. <clears throat> and then in the example is the iron copper binding head capsules. So with the iron and the copper, um, if you look at uh, this, that shows the pictorial representation of the difference when they tailor the surface to capture the composition. Iron on the left, lower left, or copper show drastically different composition. If you use a copper cathode, it only gives you C2, C3, uh, and then some CO. But when we combine the iron copper and modify with the potassium, over 50% of the product is a C2, a C5 and a higher, in other words, a liquid hydrocarbon. It's a jet fuel and gasoline. And 20% of the product is a C2, C4 olefin. So now using this type of catalyst, producing jet fuel or gasoline or lower olefin is a reality. And they, this performance is excellent. So we have done the computational chemistry to study why it is what it is. And and to cut a long story short, we found that the reaction pathway had been changed by changing the surface composition from a CO2 to the CO reaction pathway. Now, instead, by putting copper and that iron together, we can shift the CO2 in a different pathway to, to produce the HCOO star. On the lower right uh, figure, you'll see the channel reaction pathway become dramatic shift. We create a new path from CO2 all the way to hydrocarbon star, and which is the key intermediate of CC coupling to produce a C2 and a higher hydrocarbon. The critical message from the right hand chart is that the CO2 no longer goes through CO intermediate or CO gas as a 
product or intermediate for C2 and the higher hydrocarbon formation. Now, this is a theoretical simulation in our work. It does not mean that theoretically proven. If only the, um, if we did it right, we can create a new pathway. New pathway give a higher selectivity to C2 and the higher hydrocarbon. So we achieved that. Um, for separate uh, type of product for methanol, George Ola, Professor George Ola become famous uh, in the uh, George Ola uh, methanol economy. And so uh, I received the award uh, with uh, Professor George Ola's name, George Ola Award, also because I have uh, started the thinking along the area of uh, renewable and sustainable energy development. In 1995 article, I also quoted Professor George Ola uh, in his statement. Um, now, here is a George Ola methanol plant <clears throat> located in uh, Iceland, and they named George Ola plant, although George Ola has nothing to do with this plant, um, because they, they followed George Ola's idea to make methanol from CO2 and using commercial catalysts, and they electrolyze water and then capture the CO2 from geothermal stream, and then using CO2 and the water reactant to make methanol. So that, and we have developed some new catalysts and that can be selectively geared toward the methanol or geared toward the CO or geared toward the methane. In this chart, you'll see that for a palladium copper bimetallic catalyst, when we shift the atomic composition in the range of somewhere between 30 to 33% palladium in the atomic composition, we have a dramatic enhancement on methanol production. If we have a little bit of palladium and mostly copper, then we dramatically shift and speed up the activity for CO production. Um, and here is a, our DLT calculation chart to show that with the two different palladium copper atomic species, we create a very low energy barrier pathway by palladium copper 101 surface that will tailor the CO2 hydroxyl to methanol pathway on this and through the CO2 to HCTOO star, eventually to CH3O star to, to methanol formation. So to cut a long story short, um, using methanol as a starting material, we can do the production through methanol to olefin. On the up chart, we can tailor the methanol olefin to C2, C3, or tailor methanol production selected to C4. Or by changing the catalytic formulation, on the lower chart, you see that we produce over 70% of the liquid product being the C5 plus hydrocarbons. And being the hydrocarbons, over 70% is aromatic. In other words, poly and dye and the like. We can select the tailored aromatic compound in the production as well. So from CO2, we can produce various chemicals, materials, and fuels. Um, there's a separate type of a chemical uh, where CO2 is a, a lot, and that is biogas. Biogas essentially contains half CO2, half methane. And so we also try to convert the biogas using new hollow nanostructure catalysts to convert the biogas. And we now, uh, by uh, um, encapsulating platinum and nickel, we can select to convert the biogas into syngas. Uh, most recently, in the last two minutes, let me talk about um, our recent work on plasma, non thermal plasma conversion of CO2. And this will be more efficient than the current thermal chemical process because uh, plasma is uh, uh, the force matter, and this uh, matter exists in the sun, in sun, or most parts of the universe. By making use of the non thermal plasma at the low temperature, we can activate the molecule a lot more efficiently. As you can see from the left chart here, compared to the plasma reaction. Plasma reaction itself does not depend on temperature. The red curve on the left, left graph showing that from room temperature all the way up to 400 degrees C, plasma conversion goes on its own. That's not depend on temperature. Later plasma begin to make a huge difference. Thermal chemical reaction does not happen until you reach a high temperature. When we combine a heterogeneous catalyst with non thermal plasma, we begin to sub essentially enhance the catalysis at a lower temperature. For example, even at a 200, 250 degrees C, we can make a lot more conversion 
which no longer require a one percent or two percent conversion as you see report literature. Now we're not looking at a 70 percent, 80 percent per pass conversion because the plasma conversion is far more efficient and at lower temperature. So by using this, and I actually well, to cut the long story short, let me show you that by tailoring the catalyst and the reactor configuration in one single pass at low temperature, we can produce over 40% C2 and higher hydrocarbons in one plasma pass. Just a flow this through in a reactor which is the size of our sum in our hand, just the size of our sum, it gives you mostly the hydrocarbon product and, and dominant portion can be C2 and the higher hydrocarbon. And this can be maintained as safe operation in the non-thermal plasma. And similarly, we did the SO2 conversion because fluid gas contains sulfur. We use a molecular battery adorbent to select the capital SO2. We design a new process to selectively reduce SO2 to elemental sulfur. Uh, again, plasma alone does not do much for sulfur, but when we combine the plasma with the catalyst, we dramatically enhance the conversion and not only the conversion. Now we can selectively convert SO2 in one single step to elemental sulfur. For example, it's the ion catalyst or cobalt catalyst showing on the right hand chart. When you use a plasma, long plasma does some conversion, but it gives you one third of conversion and um, a one third of product that is desired and the two thirds are not desired. When we do the catalytic plasma reaction, nearly 99% is a desired product. We can reduce SO2 to elemental sulfur in one single step. So this has been highly desirable in our recent work. So to uh, summarize what I shared with you, CO2 capture and CO2 utilization, they present a major challenge, also major opportunity for us to develop a carbon neutral fuels and chemicals. CO2 conversion using hydrogen produced from water can create a more sustainable and resilient supply chain for chemical and fuels. Catalysts and plasma catalysts allow with a novel nanoporous material for capturing and converting CO2 to the fuels and chemicals with renewable energy. It really can not only mitigate the CO2 emission, but also reduce consumption of fossil fuel, help us to create a new supply chain. In the area of new reaction engineering, we found that the non-thermal plasma and catalysis can significantly enhance the CO2 conversion at a low temperature and toward the desired product. And the same goes true for SO2 uh, reduction to elemental sulfur, which is part of the full gas management in our plant. So many people have done research with me over the years. I'm very grateful to uh, DOE and mostly DOE for our CO2 work and our co-workers for CO2 conversion, including many of my former students and co-workers and uh, postdocs, our collaborators at Penn State and Randy Weinert at Argo National Lab and Roger Glaser at the Leipzig University in, in Germany. And for CO2 conversion, many of our current and former group members at Penn State and also Ximen Guo, uh, Xiao Wanyi, Wang Hui Zhang, He Yan Li, uh, and our team collaborators at the DOT, Dalian University of Technology, and also Jeff Miller at the Purdue University and Prasad Saraki at the Chile Lanka University. Some of the figures below show the key uh, people who did the contribution to the early work. And our collaborator and team uh, as part of Penn State that and joined the Center for Energy Research, our photo uh, of our team standing beside me, the Professor Ximen Guo, and also uh, our uh, collaborator team in Dalian in conjunction with the Penn State that and joined the Center for Energy. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and thank you all for spending your Friday evening time with me here. And uh, if there's time available, I'll be happy to answer questions. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The thunderous applause. Uh, we have questions. People have, uh, Cesar, you got a question. Um, thank you, Professor Jun San. A very interesting seminar. Um, I, I have a question for the CO2 to methanol and to methanol to hydrocarbon in the presence of the zeolite. Uh, do you have you studied long term 
uh, catalytic activity or, or the activation of the catalyst, uh, you are going to produce a lot of water and that water in the long term will affect your catalyst. Have you done any, any long term study with those systems? Um, in our own work, we have not done that. Uh, our collaborators lab has done a lot of work on methanol to hydrocarbon conversion. And so um, together with uh, our collaborator, one of, or two of them are our students, uh, specialized in methanol to hydrocarbon conversion. So in that part of work, not in our CO2 work, in that part of work, we did conduct the long-term studies uh, on, the, on the methanol conversion catalyst. And typically we use the zeolite catalyst and the trick that we found is to tailor the pore structure and uh, select or shift the silica alumina ratio. Uh, these are the two most important factors to make the catalyst more stable. And specifically, there were uh, several recent papers reported from our group, also together with our collaborators, that we found that if you make metal pores, um, make the uh, DSM-5 type of structure metal pores, when you synthesize the structure, coupled with uh, the basic treatment in the post-synthesis treatment, you can make that type of zeolite very stable for the methanol conversion in long time. And, and so incidentally, um, Professor Jungmin Liu and I co-advised one PhD student. He had to commercialize the methanol to olefin conversion. He has over 20 commercial plants running already using his technology. Now that part, I'm not the inventor. So he is the inventor uh, in his group in Dalian Institute of Chemical Physics where I was uh, an adjunct professor or visiting professor. Uh, but my student in our team in Dalian, he is our student together with Professor Simon Guo. We co-write co the student because there was a joint program, a joint PhD program. In there, we explored a lot on zeolite stability issues for the conversion of methanol to hydrocarbons. In the same way, we found out that when we directly do the CO2 conversion to methanol or to aromatics, um, we found that uh, first of all, we need to tailor the catalyst for methanol synthesis and the catalyst for methanol conversion. So for example, if we want to make the other things, sample seem to be better with the special selectivity for C4, if we want to make a C4. And if we want to make aromatic, for example, dilian and the like, um, modify the ZSM5 is much better for that effect. So that answer yes. your question, Sidar. Thank okay. you. So we have a, a question in the chat. Uh, we actually have. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, it's from uh, Sajik Bashir. Um, actually, you have two of them. You want to ask your questions? Because you have a couple of these already in the uh, chat. Yes, I yes I can. Um, um, so thank thank. Well, Please, I really enjoy this talk. Um, um, so my thinking was, uh, you spoke about your baskets and and how you get a liquefied uh, uh, type of interface, and that's much more efficient. But what about using something like ionic liquids? Um, that you have a charge separation, oh, yeah. so you have your um, amide group as you do, and then you have your say potassium ion or some type of charge. Um, I was thinking, would, would I allow oh, to yeah, trap my lower it temperatures? Um, then um, um, your uh, your profile, remember 250 degrees, could you do a lower temperatures? That's more akin to uh, photosynthesis. Oh, yes. Um, indeed, uh, one of my friend, the uh, Professor So Yan Zhang's group, actually has done some very interesting work in ion liquid for CO2 capture. And recently, um, Alisa Park at uh, Columbia University is also using nano capsule to trap the liquid inside the nano capsule for CO2 capture. So yes, you can do that, um, different from ion liquid, but uh, Hildebrand at uh, Pacific Northwestern National Lab is using pure organic liquid for the CO2 capture. So in principle, ion liquid can also work, can be used as ion liquid alone, or in support of the form. The uh, issue in early work of ion liquid was that the functional group was not uh, sufficient, so the capacity was a little small. And then some later variation that 
um, by adapting the amino functional group or directly incorporate into the chain structure of ionic liquid, the CO2 absorption capacity can be made much higher. Of course, there are also other issues with ionic liquid. It's very interesting material, but yes, it can be done. It can be enhanced. Thank you. That's your uh, first question. What's your second? Um, well, my second question, uh, I'm going to change it from what I typed. I was just going to ask you, you, you demonstrated a number of transition metals, um, copper, iron, and then you talked about ZSM. Is there um, kind of a straightforward strategy for people that are interested in CCS uh, to look at the periodic table uh, and transition metals? Is there a particular uh, kind of strategy to this or, uh, or is it more of a comb combinational approach, which is, uh, you know, you look at, uh, you know, the D1 <laughs> and then you go down the periodic table and then try those different combinations and see what happens. Yes, um, uh, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, there are two strategies. First, you need to activate the CO2. So what can you use to activate the CO2? There are two different atoms in CO2. There's a carbon and there's oxygen. If you want to activate the carbon, you need to have some electron-rich metal to activate the carbon. If you want to activate the oxygen, then you need to add, use some type of surface vacancy, which tend to become metal oxygen, oxide species. So these are the two general strategies that you can go for. And they, there's an evolving one more recently, the proposal that non-metallic catalysts, in other words, no, no longer go by periodical table. You can use carbon-free materials, uh, so metal-free material for catalysts, for example, using spectral structure of carbon. Uh, one of the example is uh, carbon nitride, as an example. So one of our team members, uh, 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 Professor Kuyan mm -hmm. Lee in our team, <coughs> She's working on carbon nitride based catalysts for CO2 reduction under photochemical conditions. Uh, on the metal side, yes, if you go on the carbon activation strategy, then you tend to choose the transition metal and that can offer the electron donation to carbon. And if you want to go for oxygen activation, then you go to oxide that tend to generate oxygen vacancy. For example, zinc oxide, zirconium oxide, indium oxide. These are the type of structures, not a limit to this, also the some combination of this. So um, if, well, in, in some of my reviews, I discussed the chemistry, but my friend Michele Arista in Italy, he has written a review, which is much better than my review on coordination chemistry. He wrote a book called the CO2 Conversion and we are, the first chapter is about a coordination chemistry for CO2. Uh, so I learned a lot from my, my friend Michaela in that, uh, in that chemistry. So I would advise you for the chemistry of CO2 interaction. And Wolfgang Lattner and your Max Planck Institute also wrote a review um, in, the, uh, in the journal called uh, um, Angman Shmi. And we are, the CO2 conversion chemistry is also discussed in detail. So there are a couple of reviews that will tell you more on the chemistry side. You can look into homo interaction, homo lumo interaction, or Lewis acid based interaction. Both of these two will lead you to the two different types of material, just depending on how you think. Thank you, and I will read those reviews. Okay. We have, we have a question. We have a question in the chat from uh, a Penn State student. Uh, Ramesh Babu Koma, who is interested oh. in knowing about the possibility of producing electricity from the absorbed carbon dioxide. Um, that's a very interesting thought. Um, I personally have not thought about uh, producing electricity using the, um, the absorption process. You actually trying to say that the heat that we release by CO2 absorption can produce electricity. And it's certainly interesting thought, but I, I can share with you on two new things. One is some recent research is trying to make use of a minor change in the heat, and that is thermal switch. Using that thermal switch to convert that into electricity. And, and actually one of my friend is doing that. Um, actually the reverse process, the current using our laptop. Our laptop, the reason that we have a, a um, portable and light laptop these days 
is because there's a thermal electrical cooling. And that uses electricity to generate a cold coal to cool the computer. On the other hand, you can use the opposite using that heat to generate electricity so that the reverse thermal electric effect. In principle, you can. And the, uh, the reason that I'm not sure for this is that the, the temperature difference in the type of pseudo absorption that we created is rather small, only 30 degrees C temperature gap. And this is one reason why this type of material is a much, much more efficient, thermally efficient, because we don't require a huge thermal swing between adsorption and desorption. But on the other hand, the temperature difference is small, making use of thermal electric also lower efficiency. Ramesh, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. But then I was working on like um, an idea theoretically um, on how how I could probably use like a thermocouple effect uh, in order to generate more electricity because we could have uh, you know um, probably uh, uh, other chemicals uh, at the liquid states you know probably like liquid oxygen and nitrogen uh, you know at a very um, low end. Um, where the, there's a cold junction and then at the hot junction, we could probably talk about the heat uh, absorbed by the carbon dioxide. So, you know, if, if we probably trap this from ambient air uh, and then, you know, we have like uh, a lot of uh, temperature difference about at least 100 degrees Celsius or more than that, I think that would generate a good amount of uh, electricity. But then this is an idea I'm actually looking forward to working on uh, at Penn State actually. and uh, I'm just a sophomore and then I'm looking at how to work on it. So I would like to know if you have any thoughts on that, sir. Oh, well, that's great. I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And so we can certainly chat more of that uh, if you like. I also have uh, something more to, to share with you um, in that area. Okay, good luck to your work. Thank you. Okay. We have a couple okay. more hands. We have uh, Dunley Ma yes. uh, has a question. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Sun, thank you for the very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I'm particularly interested uh, in your research about plasma enhanced uh, catalysis. So, ah, so my okay. question, yeah, my question is about, you know, do you need to, to use any carrier gas in this uh, plasma involved synthesis? And uh, what's the voltage you have to use for plasma generation? Is it really oh, okay. like a cost effective? And also what exactly is the mechanism for plasma enhanced uh, uh, catalysis? Uh, okay, okay, that's an excellent question, thank you. Um, the way the plasma works is that you actually generate a hot electron and cold the bottom. For example, you have a molecule, um, you knock out the electron from the molecule, the, the electron become hot, kinetic in high energy. But the bulk of that molecular group remain at room temperature. So this is called a non-thermal plasma. And that electron flying out has a high energy. It can activate the molecule that you need to activate. And this is the reason why plasma can be very effective at a low temperature. In terms of efficiency, um, and, and first we need to recognize that plasma certainly requires electrical energy as input. So, um, the electrical energy currently is generated by fossil fuel, only by 37% efficiency. The highest efficiency in Denmark is only 39%. And so in other words, we face 60%. So that electricity cannot come from fossil energy. It has to be renewable energy to be based. And having said that, the actual reaction for energy conversion is more efficient because you heat all the molecules, all the reactant, including reactor to high temperature. So you save a tremendous amount of energy on the thermal heat investment. You no longer need that. And second, by using plasma together with the catalyst, if you tailor them well, you can make the reaction far more selective. And therefore, you use energy more efficiently and that makes the, more, more, the reaction more efficient. And the third is that your part about that, how much energy you use. For plasma, you do need a high voltage generator. For the result that I showed you, we typically use a seven watt to 10 watt. So it's a smaller scale and smaller reactor. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. You just You're answered welcome. another question from the chat and a question I had about the energy efficiency of catalytic plasma process. And uh, Sarah uh, Kurtz had that, that question in the chat, and I had that question also. So we have, I think, one more question. You long? Is, you know, you, oh, your hand's not up anymore. I, my hand is up. I can ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> your hand was up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, please. Okay. Hi, uh, Professor Song. Nice presentation. I'm a PhD student from Clemson University, South Carolina. I have a free question. Um, I don't know if I missed it. Could you comment on the active sites of your carbon, the structure of your active sites? Uh, the structure of, of your carbon active site, the active sites of your carbon. Yes, yes. Um, on the uh, iron, iron copper catalyst, the active site is. Uh, Four hollow structure where there is, if you look into the surface, uh, I'm not sure you can see my hand. I do. Um, surface hollow structure that where you have a metal atom, a part of metal atom in the four hollow structure is replaced by copper. And by doing so, that we created a four hollow site and CO2 then attach on this site. And then the metal donate the D electron to the carbon in CO2. So the CO2 is a linear molecule. Now the CO2 sit in burning mode. The carbon down, the two oxygen up, and the four hollow sites here, this is the active site structure. And if you'd like to know more, our 2017 paper in Journal of Physical Chemistry C specifically report on the active site structure for this type of the catalyst. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, are there any other questions? Now I'm gonna try something. It says here I can ask all to unmute. I'm asking <laughs> you all to unmute and so we can, you know, uh, give Jusan a, a round of applause and thank him for a very nice talk. I'm glad to see all you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank very you. Good. So we had a, a, at one point we had 61 people here. Oh wow. wow. <laughs> That's pretty good. I also see a friend from Japan. Dr. Ikushima, good to see you. <laughs> I mean, I have one more question. If at this time I have one more question. Uh, okay, please. Okay, so uh, in your uh, review article um, earlier in Catalysis today, you mentioned about carbon capture, and now there's uh, talk to meet the current uh, um, demands by the Biden administration. It's unlikely that wind and solar can meet that demand. So one of the things people think about is using uh, post-combustion CO2 capture in uh, current power plants using coal, for example, I think the current strategy is using supercritical uh, approaches to capture, you know, CO two from pulverized, pulverized coal. In your opinion, what would be the best way to uh, make these coal power stations, which are the dominant source for electricity in the U.S., uh, more okay. greener before we go to one hundred percent wind and, and battery and solar, which is probably 20, 30, 50 years from now? Yes, yes, and that's a very good question, and of course. Uh, um, I have worked with uh, US DOE for 30 years, and I was leading a US DOE funded uh, university coalition with the 15 universities in this area, in you know, CO2 capture and conversion. So I know in general policy, but of course, uh, President Biden has an ambitious new plan. And our uh, US DOE also has a launched a new plan to further uh, CO2 capture and storage research um, you might know that the general background is that two years ago, U.S. government pushed out a new policy that's called the 45Q. The 45Q policy is U.S. government tax incentive that if you capture one ton of CO2, you sequester one ton of CO2, or you otherwise use one ton of CO2 to make something else, the government will give you $45. So this is the essence of 45Q new tax policy. This is now legally effective already. 
and I served on the U.S. National Coal Council for one year. Uh, during that time, the president announced a new plan called the 45Q. Our new president, that was under the previous president, our new president is more ambitious in launching the plan to reach the more carbon neutral world, first reaching the peak and then reaching the carbon new neutrality. And so toward that, U.S. Department of Energy is the agency that carry on the president's vision. And there are two general parts. One is more aggressively develop renewable energy. Solar wind, for example, we have made the solar wind into the digital range. For many years, since 1970, well, Randy and I, we worked in the area of energy since the 1970s. And we know that the solar from 1970 to 1990, for 20 years, invest many billion dollars. The growth in solar is less than 0.1%. All right. However, in the last 10 years, solar has finally come into the digit in the US primary energy supply. Now it's 1.05% of US primary energy solar. 2.5% of US primary energy is now wind energy, okay? And then 4% of US primary energy now is biomass. So these are renewable. And then 0.2% is a geothermal. So the government plan to further enhance the renewable energy supply in our primary energy portfolio for one. Second is, and this part will use renewable energy naturally cut down CO2. But as I showed you, US energy is 85% carbon based. Global energy is 84% carbon based. So we cannot talk about uh, the carbon neutrality without mitigating the CO2 emission from our primary energy. And so the other strategy as a major backbone is using CCSU together with the current fossil plant or the future fossil plant that continue to see us. The strategy there is develop more technology to make the CO2 capture and conversion more efficient. Sequester CO2 in saline aquifer. And then the third strategy, the US Department of Energy under the new administration and our new Secretary of Energy just announced two days ago is that further support US energy R&D to drop down the cost of hydrogen production. You might know that for the last 20 years, DOE target was $2 per kilogram of hydrogen by 2020. We've been talking about this goal for the last 20 years. And suddenly this month, DOE announced another goal that is a drop from $2 to $1 per kilogram of CO2 by 2030. This is a brand new target, Secretary of Energy in the US Department just announced this week. So now you can see that there will be new energy R&D in supporting us to achieve the carbon neutrality through three ways. One, enhance renewable energy. Two, CO2 capture storage, utilization three, enhancing or dropping hydrogen energy production to put more for hydrogen fuel cell cars, electrical vehicles, and that will cut down the uh, transportation sector CO2. So that's a, a bit of a long answer to your question, Sajin. Thank you, very informative. Yeah, you know, something happened, has happened recently, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, as of as of February, the total fossil production of of electricity is only sixty percent, and of that forty percent is gas, so twenty percent is coal. So right now, yeah. and and I know that they're planning on on actually turning all the coal plants off in Illinois fairly soon. So it's you know, and gas should be much easier to to capture to the CO2 from, I would think, because you don't have all, all the issues with all of this, the particle, fine particle stuff. And yes, yes, indeed. Cool. Indeed, and uh, Randy, we actually first did a pilot plant test at the Penn State demonstration boiler system. We put our CO2 molecular back absorbent on mobile reactor part and directly take the power plant. 
we did a two part of the test. One burn, another part of the test burning natural gas. And the flue gas using natural gas as a fuel, it's very easy to separate. With our molecular battery absorbent, we don't do anything it's separated beautifully. But with coal, the performance gradually degrade because of SO2, the sulfur in coal. It began to add on. So that's one reason why we developed a sulfur-specific molecular basket absorbent, which only captures sulfur dioxide and in the presence of CO2 flow, it doesn't do anything. So we can capture SO2 separately and then in a, a big tower a reactor, we capture CO2. So the release of CO2 will no longer contain SO2 or NO2. Now on the energy side, I actually, uh, to, to address the question around the interest rates, I can share a couple of slides. Just I, I done homework on the global energy. Um, well, maybe not, but I'll just describe it. The global energy portfolio is exactly 80% on fossil energy, but within the global scene, coal is used in 22%, 23%, um, 22, 23%, in the last several years on global energy utilization. In the US, we used to use just about eight years ago, the US number is very similar, but in the last eight years, shale gas development had to quickly displace the coal in that sector. And so the coal had to drop down to 11%. And then the, the makeup is all natural gas at new capacity. But the total portion remains roughly the same still 80% of fossil energy in our power capacity. And the, what has changed in the dramatically is the last uh, eight years, the new plant capacity built up is more based on renewable energy. And, but the base number is very large. So that capacity built up does not yet impact the whole global capacity when you look at the global number. But when you look at the, only the new capacity added you will see that in the last two years, over 70% new power plant capacity added is all based on renewable energy. So when this number coupled with the retirement of existing power plant 20 years down the road, then the renewable energy will greatly increase. And McKenzie published a report last year, which they indicated that by 2020-35 in power plant, renewable energy will overtake a fossil energy. In other words, more than half will be by renewable energy, the less than half will be by fossil energy around 2035. And Shell also produced a projection in that area. Shell's projection is somewhere around 2050-ish. But regardless of which projection, the trend we see is clearly we are moving toward burning more. Um, uh, fossil fuel only in the transportation sector and more renewable energy in the stationary power sector. That's a shift in the trend. Okay. Any other secondary questions? Oh, we're, we're still online. You know, the other, the other big thing that's, you know, for, for transportation is batteries. And so, you know, our division does energy storage. Uh, uh -huh. you know, we, we promote energy storage symposia and stuff. And so uh -huh. that's, that's, that's a big deal because, you know, if you're gonna look at it, really look at electric cars and maybe electric planes down the road, um, you, you know, it's the, the battery thing is really, really, really important, the energy storage thing, so. So that that for us that that can consume a lot of our interest is, is just looking down. Because uh, yeah. one of the really cool things in, in the carbon area is is the thought about building airframes out of batteries using mm. using carbon, you know, as electrodes and part of the airframe. Um, mm. and for uh, for for actually you know the things they do now with, with electric electric air air flight are very, very light. You know, mm -hmm. and so they can't carry a whole lot of people. But if you want to carry a lot of people, if your your if your plane is one big battery, it, it might yeah. work because the, the uh, yes. batteries are getting a lot more efficient. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I have um, uh, worked for almost ten years on developing the fuel cells.
or transportation vehicles um, using just a tiny amount of uh, liquid fuel as a filter stock by doing the adsorption for sulfur removal and then catalytic processing within a tiny device we call pump pump power. Mm -hmm. This that's self by holding in hand. That's equivalent to 150 pounds of battery. So we, we developed a system we have to de de deliver to multiple sponsor sites. And the system we develop ranges from 220 watt all the way to 10 kilowatt. Wow. And just based on the liquid fuels, and we can produce a far more power because the battery energy density is much lower. So we can use that. Now the idea is whether we can make it in the sense of an aircraft uh, system. Um, we first tried, and we were actually asked to develop a system for Navy ship propulsion system uh, using the NATO F-72 fuel, uh, a NATO F-75 fuel, uh, that is uh, heavy, heavy stuff. So we created the onboard distillation fractionator. The light portion go to our fuel cell, the heavy portion go to Navy diesel engine. We actually published that paper uh, many years ago <clears throat> in energy diffuse. So by doing this, we can create uh, electronic and uh, motor control or steering control on uh, Navy boat using fuel cell, but the heavy engine to drive the whole boat will be based on the heavy diesel, uh, the boiler fuel or the diesel engine. Uh, for airplane, the maneuver is a key issue because it need to change, if you need to change or speed up or slow down, it need to happen very, very rapid. Um, for that, the battery is good and fuel cells are not that good. But the battery have major problem for real airplane. You know, if you're talking about the electrical airplane or small airplane, it's easy. If you begin to talk about the, the carrier or for the transatlantic flight, um, it becomes gigantic because the battery will be too heavy to drag the weight of the uh, passenger weight uh, luggage weight all come. And so we have worked on the weight sensitive budget for developing fuel and power systems to replace the so-called traditional batteries. Um, so it, it is remain to be seen. Um, there was some projection that uh, the liquid jet fuel might be um, the a long surviving medium for airplane, for particularly for the transatlantic or transpacific flight, for energy density and long distance needed. Battery weight that's not carried. Um, you can install the solar plan on the face, but for the huge carrier, um, it, the energy is far from sufficient for that mission. That is something that, uh, so we think uh, liquid jet fuel uh, from CO2 might be long-term value, long-term meaning that even later this century or early next century might be the good one. Yeah, that Actually, potentially could be replaced with the electrical car for the transportation. Actually, I, I, I'm gonna miss my meeting anyway. So if you, you wanna chat after we're done here, we can do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody, any other discussion? Um, yeah. I, yes, sir. I actually have a question, Dr. Song. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is Ramesh again. So I actually wanted to understand uh, the challenges or the possibilities of uh, using the resin polymer uh, in order to capture carbon dioxide in large amounts from point sources or from ambient air because uh, I felt that, uh, you know, even the efficiency is, uh, you know, at, at an average rate, you know, what are the challenges or uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, implementing and using these resin polymers or yeah. any, uh, you know, any of your baskets as well in order to capture carbon dioxide in large amounts from air because, you know, if we could probably do something like that on a large scale, we would be able to bring down our emissions by, uh, you know, in a in a short amount of time. So, what do you talk? Uh, uh, indeed, um, you're talking about a long-term stability because of present water, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. 
So for that question, we have addressed that from two different angles. One is making the more stable um, for the material that uh, does operate in under the conditions, water vapor is an issue. And, and one way that we have found out is that um, actually published in, in some of our papers already that using modification to make the system more hydrophobic, uh, using tetraethyl also silicate to modify the molecular bath adsorbent, you can make it a more hydrophobic and stable for long term. And that is indeed something that we noted that in a long term pilot plant operation, uh, when we did a pilot plant study, we didn't realize that in laboratory work. Another approach we took, which is involved in my earlier slide, is that we designed a new type of molecular bath adsorbent that operates in the range where water vapor does not stay, does not interact. And where the peak performance is at 130, 140 degrees C. And by having that type of operation, water will simply flow through. It does not absorb heat and does not get dissolved. It simply passes through. And that also relieves a huge demand in power plant. Currently, the power plant flow gas get off the stack at 150 degrees C. So in order to do the capture in a commercial pilot plant, in a commercial operation, you first need to cool down the gas down to room temperature of 30 degrees C before they get exposed to monomethanol aiming solution for absorption. And then you heat it up to 125 degrees C where water evaporate, heat uptakes, water evaporate at all waste of energy, but only because the chemical bonding can be broken only at that time condition. That's why it's done that way. But by using our solid absorbent directly capture CO2 at that temperature, we no longer need to cool down the power plant flow gas. It can simply directly flow through our molecular basket and capture and then simply send out to the sack, which will cut down a lot of our operation. The system becomes far more efficient. Yes, I think uh, that would be, you know, uh, in order to capture more carbon dioxide as well, right? Uh, because the efficiency is higher that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Um, so Luis can can Jun, Jun and I uh, stay active for for a bit to discuss some other stuff about the division. We have control.